Banking Frontiers is a 22-year-old publication focused on the financial sector. And we cover business, technology, marketing, HR, risk, compliance, and all those kind of major areas. Banking Frontiers is a monthly publication. And in every issue, we interview around 30 to 40 senior executives from the industry to catch the pulse of the financial community. Our topic today is navigating the digital frontiers, exploring data, AI, and real-time analytics in BFSI. Now you all know the difference between navigating and driving. Driving is instantaneous, whereas navigating is long-term. Likewise, there are two flavors of transformation, short-term and long-term. So we all understand the short-term version, the digital transformation that we are seeing every day. What we need perhaps is a better understanding of the long-term version of digital transformation. For that, we have to learn from history. Where else can we go? If you go back in history, the steam engine, which was invented around 250 years ago, continues to mature. Uh, with each new version, we saw improvements in power, in efficiency, in reliability, and more. Engineers who designed and built steam engines fortunately had plenty of time to design the, each new version. Someone improved the steel quality, someone reduced the friction, someone increased the compression ratio, and so on. But imagine what would happen if those data designers did not have the luxury of time for designing the next version of whatever, a steam engine, an aeroplane, a car engine, a car battery perhaps, all these kind of things. The designs that would come out would surely be poor and would require frequent fixes, I would guess. So what we need is designers who create not just the next version of some technology, but also plan for the next three or four or five versions. I call such a person an architect, as opposed to an engineer or designer who works on contemporary problems. So you know what is changing rapidly today, right? It's software. Hence, software is an ideal system that needs architects today people who don't just create the next version, but make sure that the, the DNA of the software is so strong that it can support multiple generations of transformation with data and artificial intelligence accelerating the pace of transformation. If we need to minimize visits to a software doctor to solve problems, what we need is architects and we need more and more good architects, better architects, if I may say. With this perspective of multi-generational transformation, I welcome all of you to this webinar. We have with us two architects who are fusing short-term needs and long-term plans to create winning solutions. Our first speaker is Mr. Anish Matthew. He's a principal solutions architect for APAC at Couchbase. Earlier, he was technical architect at Netcracker Technology and technical delivery manager at Acolyte. Couchbase is a software company that helps its clients build solutions that align with today's digital ecosystem, characterized by what? Massive data, massive computations, real-time response, and high scalability. Our second speaker today is Mr. Ravi Batulla. He's a global business head in charge of payment gateway, and payment security platforms at Webmo. He has worked in technical roles at Barclays, Bank of America, and Visa. Webmo is a global leader in digital payments, payments and provides solutions for fraud and risk management, payment app authentication, mobile payments, prepaid cards, merchant services, and video verification. Anish will speak first. Hi all, uh, me Anish, as Manoj gave me the introduction, I work as a principal solutions architect uh, at uh, Couchbase for the Asia Pacific region. 
and uh, I take care of the innovations that customers are doing in with Couchbase and help them get uh, and use Couchbase in the best possible. This is just a QR code, just in case you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, and uh, that's me. So we'll take a few minutes to talk about uh, how or what are the major issues that uh, banking sector face, or what are the possibilities of data and AI coming together in the banking sector, and a, a bit of discussion on uh, what are the possible opportunities we have in the banking sector with AI uh, coming in as a boom. And we'll also talk about some of the challenges and how Couchbase as a product, as a database, as a data platform can solve some of it. AI is currently a buzzword. So everyone wants AI in this. Every vertical wants AI in this. May some of those, some of these requirements or some of these asks come out of uh, knowledge about AI. Some of these come of knowledge, uh, not having enough knowledge of AI. AI cannot solve everything, but it can solve some of these uh, requirements, some of the areas much better than any other existing system. And some areas or some op uh, options or opportunities in the banking sector is no different. Banking sector compared to any other sector requires more of information security, more of innovation, more of compliance uh, requirements. And banking sector is a well-regulated, well-streamlined uh, sector, which basically requires a lot more infrastructure, a lot more features that any data platform, any component, any, any platform for that matter can offer. And as the days go by, God knows, uh, there, was a, there was a time when we used to walk into a banking counter and only the banking executive or the counter, the clerk had access to a database or an, or an application. We used to get our passbooks printed. We used to have our a, a list or receipts given to us or a teller giving us cash. But now banks have come to us to our devices, to our phones. So information is being passed from banking banks behind the counters to the devices which we have in our hands. So with all these, the customer experience, the customer satisfaction is being improved and is being optimized by while keeping all the regulatory compliances, all the security features, security requirements, the protection of the PII, all of that information is being kept secure, kept in uh, protection and improving the customer experience. All those coming together is a big challenge. So that is where AI comes and helps the banking sector in a lot of ways. Some of the factors where banking sector can use AI is like, Productivity optimization, getting more done with less amount of resources, less amount of people, and as in any vertical uh, optimization and productivity optimization of resources and people is like baseline for any industry. Customer satisfaction, as I was mentioning, banks need uh, more better customer satisfaction, not just in transactions, but in the whole interaction with the device. Customized solutions for each of them. Not everyone needs a car loan. Not everyone needs a uh, needs a home loan or a personal loan. So banks identifying who is probably going to require a personal loan, who is probably require, going to require a credit card, identifying that becomes more imperative in a banking sector, the success of a bank account. With business optimization in the care, in the sense that the workflows need to be optimized, you cannot ask people to walk in to a bank with the papers of uh, copies of uh, all their uh, documentation. It has to be integrated with the system that they have. If it is digitally possible, uh, have it digitally signed, and we, you uh, sign in an Aadhaar card or you sign in a document there. You can't have people verifying it. If you can get AI to do it, that is an opportunity. So the opportunities or the possibilities of AI being in the in a or participating in a banking sector is huge. Along with all these security improvements, uh, fraud uh, risk management, fraud detection, and we can we can keep counting the opportunities in the banking sector where uh, AI can be used. Now let's name a few of them. Cybersecurity and fraud detection. I'm sure Ravi has a big uh, presentation or maybe like a big experience in that area. So he'll talk a lot more about that. Where cybersecurity and fraud detection in the banking sector, how important it is, where I don't want somebody else to uh, enact as me and take my money off. So I don't want any uh, frauds happening in my account and every individual has that requirement. And so fraud detection on the banks, not post operation fraud detection, live fraud detection becomes imperative. And AI can help in that because AI can identify patterns, it can identify a possible fraud uh, transaction and alert the bank, alert the consumer, customer based on that. Chatbots, you know, we, we don't call up a customer care every now and then. If my chatbot is able to give me valid responses, 
that will be an added advantage for a banking customer experience. Or if the chatbot is giving me general responses, I'll stop chatting with that. I'm not going to interact more than a third message or a fourth message with a chatbot, which is not intelligent enough. So AI can help the chatbots become more customized, more uh, specific to the point that is being asked by the customer. Loans and credit decisions, how good is this guy going to perform? How good is this person going to uh, do in his job, in his salary, in his account management? Will he be able to pay back the loan? All those decisions can be, AI can help with those. With the stock markets, with the uh, market analysis, how is, which stocks to purchase, which stocks to broke for. So everything, everything related to stock market can be analyzed better by AI. And for all these, what we need is the data. Data is going to drive all these AI machines. They are not going to uh, uh, create or make a decision out of thin air. So they need data. And collecting these multiple data points, multiple verticals, multiple uh, function points for the data and analysis of each of them requires a lot of uh, intelligence and requires a lot of processing power, which AI can provide in the banking sector. Customer experience, as we talked about, is a huge area in which we have hours to talk. Uh, we can talk for hours on the customer experience, how it can be improved. Risk management assets, assets fraud detection is also important in terms of deposits, in terms of investments, in terms of loans. And uh, doing all these without a regulatory compliance is, a, is, a, is like uh, shooting on your, your own foot. So you need the compliance of uh, compliance with the regulatory decisions, regulatory norms uh, that the country RBI provides in India. So compliance of that can be uh, the transactions. Are they going to be compliant? Are the operations going to be compliant can be deducted or evaluated by an AI engine if built uh, on, on the same. And that that will ensure that even before an incident happens, the possibility of an incident or possibility of a, an issue is identified much early in the process. Predictive analytics for all these, all that we talked about earlier and automating the processes that the banks have. That is a huge step that the banks are optimizing. Even now, they are actually optimizing the processes like you give a give a card, they're using uh, tools to read through the document and tell that, okay, this, this document is valid, this document can be used. So in terms of uh, usability, in terms of customer experience, banks have a lot, a lot to uh, use AI for. And this can be predictive AI, this can be generative AI, and all forms of AI can be used in the banking sector in different areas. But just because this can be used or these are required, banks cannot jump into it. Because there are a lot more, lot of challenges, especially because banks involve with people's money, and I'm not compromising a rupee from my account for anything that a bank makes, for any mistake that a bank makes. It can be my mistake. I transfer to a wrong person is different, but bank cannot make a mistake and lose my money, and that will be the last thing I want. I expect from a bank. So, banks have to be extremely careful in handling this AI, and some of these challenges are the the problem that for all these years suddenly do you need all these data points for AI to work? It is a problem that the data quality is not uh, as per uh, uh, as, as, as much as it is required to be now they can we start collecting the data for ai to be consuming it yes we can but that will mean that ai will take another set of years to be implemented so shortage of quality data is a big thing that uh, banks are or do, uh, any inter any institution any organization is facing especially in the banking sector is, is more valid they cannot compromise on the data. So data privacy and security is a big issue. So it can be in the data uh, storage, it can be the processing, can be in the LLM or the other AI engines they use. So everywhere the data security and the data privacy become a big factor. Regulatory compliance with any innovations that we do, you cannot go out of a regulatory compliance. You cannot go out of a regulatory norm that the country or RBI has provided. So you have to be under the regulatory compliance. So that becomes a challenge in itself with the existing operations and with uh, AI coming in, with all these AI engines, LLMs coming in, that becomes more of a challenge uh, than it is now. And you need skilled people to work on AI, to analyze the data, for ML, for to create patterns out of the data, and to work on the AI engine, create an engine, uh, you need a lot, of, lot more skill than what is available in the market. So that becomes a challenge with it. Legacy systems that the banks use, uh, more of the, the pinnacles of the world, the GP2s of the world, the legacy systems are not made in an era where AI was a boom. So having the systems upgraded is a challenge or, a, or it's a cost in itself, it's an effort in itself for the AI to be in, uh, pulled in or uh, imbibed into the banking sector. So what happens is that before even they step into the AI uh, implementation 
for all the factors that we talked about earlier, all these challenges have to be solved. The trust on the AI, the explainability of what is being done in the AI, all these become questions because the, all the Gemini uh, was accused of a racist uh, term. Uh, if, and the Microsoft chatbot, which was uh, brought in a few years earlier, uh, started making uh, offensive remarks. So AI is not as, as refined as it is expected to be as of now. Yes, you have self-driving cars. You have uh, AI gener generative AI in many of the systems, uh, in many of the uh, verticals, but it is not as refined as it should be for a banking sector to imbibe. So there are a, there are a few challenges we can solve. There are a few challenges which will take time to evolve and get refined and uh, be uh, useful. So for all the challenges that we can solve, let's take some time to discuss how Couchbase can solve it. Because I am from Couchbase, I I will be able to tell, okay, we can solve a few of them. We can solve a set of the challenges that we are talking about. And let's see how Couchbase can solve uh, the challenges that we are talking about in the banking sector for getting AI into the system. All right. So just be before jumping into how we can solve, let's talk about a bit of what is Couchbase. Couchbase is essentially a distributed NoSQL database with JSON storage. And we have a memory first architecture based on the genetics. So the performance is an optimal is, is optimal in Couchbase. And we have, because it's a uh, distributed NoSQL database, scalability is last, you can scale the database to a large extent. So AI, when we talk about large amount of data that is required, large uh, volume and variety in the data points of multiple data points required on each um, item, we are talking about a lot uh, big volume and that volume can be handled by a distributed NoSQL database like Couchbase. And with the performance of the memory first architecture, we'll be able to solve the performance requirement and the legacy um, and the, uh, the speed and the requirements that AI needs which the legacy system cannot solve. And we've got persistence and because of the database, we have persistence inside. We also have transactions and we have replication of data to ensure that the data is available always. So being a database, uh, just existing as a database is different from surviving and being the best in the market. And that's what Fortress is doing in terms of distributed structure with a JSON storage, with the replication that is built around it. Transactions, which were the monopoly of RDBMS, bringing them to a NoSQL database. So bringing the capability of JSON along with the strength of RDBMS is what Fortress has done in terms of architecture and all the features which are built around it. We have query capability that's a SQL, with SQL you can use the exact same SQL language which was used with RDBMS to query data from a couch base where the data model is much more complicated. So there's no complication added because of the data model. We are able to do the query with the uh, old uh, SQL language, which is familiar to all of them. So, and we have value fetching, we have typical indexing, the full text search, which is basically the initial step of uh, that data. So that is the first step to uh, analytics or the rudimentary form of uh, intelligence built in was uh, getting the understanding the natural language and that is what a full text search is and full text search is part of uh, Couchbase uh, product assets and we have data analytics operational analytics so we were talking about uh, real-time analytics in the, in the today's tagline itself the topic of the today's discussion is about real-time analytics and we as at Couchbase is able to give the analytics uh, because of the architecture that we have and just on the uh, last uh, front the wrapping of the all the features together in a unified programming model that is JSON and the security that is required for the data to be uh, saved in a database. So uh, having the, the regulatory compliance in the banking sector we talked about, protecting the PII, encryptions required for the data and all the protection that uh, un, un, uh, enforcing that people cannot access the data uh, in the database without prior authorization. So such uh, security deployment, security uh, practices and security requirements, along with all the uh, deployment methodologies that are available uh, currently in the world, like bare metals, possibly VMs, clouds, self-managed, database as a service, all of them is packed, uh, packed in the Couchbase uh, product. And this makes it a uh, ideal database for OLTP and OLAP, OLAP workloads. And along when the data volume is high, when AI is coming to the picture, <coughs> in databases, how much of intelligence the database can provide to the AI uh, implementation that will that much uh, lighter the AI can be. So the database has to uh, cope up with the speed and the velocity and the volume that the AI mandates and Couchbase is one such database which can do that. And along with this, we have got a few more features 
which uh, uh, something like columnar storage, where we have, uh, I mean, we all know analytics works the best on columnar storage. And, uh, even though our OLTP engine is a JSON engine, we have a columnar storage based analytical engine, which is basically faster than uh, faster uh, than any JSON or the other row based storage engines for analytics. So Couchbase has got its capabilities which can help in the uh, AI, and it has already implemented some of the AI features. As it is. So if you see the SQL query, we have got a generating AI engine which helps you write a SQL query in the most optimal way that Couchbase can do. So, uh, for example, if you go to ChatGPT, ChatGPT is kind of an expert in everything. It will not give you a response which is tailor made for Couchbase. Correct? But Couchbase Generative AI, how it is integrated, Generative AI engine integrated with Couchbase, gives you the capability of generating a query which is tailor made for Couchbase. That Generative AI might not talk to you about a MongoDB query or an RDBMS or a query, but it knows exactly how the Couchbase query should be and what is the most optimal way of implementing it. And the most optimal way of executing, and that is what Couchbase has started with generative AI in its own engine. So we are moving ahead with the AI implementation in our, our system itself, where uh, so we understand what AI requirements are, so what we understand what AI capabilities are, and we are able to solve them for the uh, banking sector specifically, especially when because the requirements and the compliance requirements, the regulatory uh, norms are much tighter in a banking sector than in the banks. All right, and let's talk about a bit more about uh, the volume in, in uh, of data. So you're not in a in a large system. You're not storing data in one place. Not storing data in one place. What Couchbase has is a geo replication capability, where uh, Couchbase can be deployed in multiple clusters across the globe, and the data can be synchronized across the globe. So your data across the globe is kind of in in sync with each other. And so you, you're not locked down to a cluster. Okay, you, you can query only this kind of data in this cluster and X, X kind of query only the other clusters, not your question. So you can have a global cluster kind of uh, scenario where your AI engine, engine, your query engine, your application is able to get the data from across the system, across the world, and operate as one unit instead of being in separated silos. All right, now, uh, how does how does this the database solve your AI problem? Couchbase doesn't solve your AI problems in banking sector, but Couchbase can supplement your AI implementation in the banking sector. It's not just in banking sector, any sector, but more, more in the banking sector because the requirements in the banking sector are much higher than the other verticals. All right, so uh, is Couchbase an AI engine? No, but you can make your AI engine using Couchbase because we, are, we understand AI and we are able to supplement and support your AI implementations. And uh, so that is what a good platform can do. Uh, a good, uh, a solid, robust data database platform, data platform like Couchbase will be able to continue, or will be able to embark uh, with your AI journey and be a big help for your AI journey in the future. With that, I'll just conclude uh, uh, my uh, presentation on the on Couchbase. So these are my uh, uh, contact details on LinkedIn and in, uh, on X platform or in Twitter. To make it simple. So. Uh, feel free to contact me. We can get in touch. And thank you. Ravi, welcome to this webinar. Uh, we'd like to hear your angle, your perspective on this. So, hi. So, I think whatever uh, you heard Anish uh, speaking, right, we'll put that into action, right, for AI. Uh, in um, the one of the use cases Anish touched upon was in fraud and risk management. And Vimo being a, you know, I mean, a, a leader in pay tech company, right? I mean, we have, you know, payments and, you know, fraud is one of the key business lines. And I'm the global head for issuing, acquiring and fraud and risk management, right, for Vimo. And the fraud and risk management engine that I'm going to quickly talk about completely runs on couch base, right? So whatever principles you saw Anish explaining, we are putting them into use in real life action, right? So. Uh, with, without further ado, so what what is Trident, right? Trident is our enterprise fraud and risk management, which is used in real time profiling of payments and real time decisioning, right? So what it means is we have SLAs ranging between fifty to you know five hundred milliseconds, right? What so some of the top large banks in India use us both the um, on the issuing side and the acquiring side, like our parent company PU uses us for the real time, you know, e-commerce transactions, which covers UPI, net banking, cards, and so on and so forth, right? So how do we do this real time uh, payment transaction risk profiling and decisioning? So we have two 
particular tracks, one is the transactions that we use based on the old history of the consumer, like based on the chargebacks, refunds that you have had on the you know um, credit card or on your payment method, right? Whether it is a net banking or a credit card or a POS transaction. And on the non-transaction inputs, what it means is like the user behavior, the device, location, the velocity, and a lot of other uh, details that get into, right, that we derive from, from the ongoing transaction, right? And both these things come together to, you know, form a real-time decision, right? I mean, let's say you are shopping, you know, using your credit card on a jewelry store versus you are using your credit card on a restaurant versus you are using a credit card while ordering food, right? or you're using UPI transaction at, you know, online e-commerce website. So for all these transactions, it's a very sophisticated engine for the uh, positive of time. I will not go into the internals, but how we, so we use, you know, Couchbase to, you know, um, create a um, unstructured JSON, you know, um, data structure. And the best part of Couchbase is that, you know, it allows us to, you know, create a data structure of up to five MB, right? I mean and then create a complex rules with various operators and do a real-time decisioning, right? So um, so let's look at some of the use cases, right? What are the fraud patterns we are talking about? We are looking at the card details, the device ID, the IP or the location details or the merchant where you are shopping. MCC is a merchant category code, like, you know, every merchant, uh, whether it is e-commerce, will have a separate category code versus a books versus a, you know, travel merchant. They will have a separate category codes in the e-commerce world. The merchant name and the time of the transaction, right? So if you see this, just this four or five dimensions of velocity, which which says that, you know, how many, how many transactions you've done using your same card within a small window of time, right? And what is the transaction burst, right? Within the same IP or a same device. It tells that, you know, some, some bad actor is trying to break into your account, right? I mean... Otherwise, why would you do, let's say, five or 10 transactions consecutively, right? I mean, so it's not a normal behavior associated with your device. Likewise, what is the negative behavior, right? What is the unusual behavior, what, is, what we were just talking about? And if it is a first time device, then you know, the chances are that, you know, if you have not used this payment method in the, let's say, last five or six months, and then you're trying to use, the risk will be much higher, right? And it will be scored accordingly. And then there is, oh, Certainly, some negative list, blacklisted entities, blacklisted devices, or blacklisted you know, locations, or a high risk locations, right? With certain zip codes, certain area codes, and all of that, right? And then there are suspicious merchants, right? It could be gambling merchants, gaming merchants. Not all gaming merchants are bad or good. So, there is a category of merchants, right? Which is like usually high risk for a um, from a chargeback or a you know money laundering or you know, any other illegal activities, right? And then a high velocity on a bad merchant. And then what is the source, right? I mean, for example, this is very common. You see people seeking donation in the name of, you know, any fake beneficiaries in, in the name of, you know, a donation or in the name of so corporate social um, responsibility and so on and so forth, right? And it could be malicious Google ads and then bad us user behavior. Just imagine all these things, if you have to do real time on any payment channel, right? Within a few milliseconds, just imagine the kind of you know um, uh, advanced capabilities you will need. Without AI, you cannot do it, right? On a on a simple rule engine or a simple you know compute, right? So AI is definitely powering all this, and this is not a static list, right? This is the the data is constantly changing. So without AI, you cannot do it. And then even for the um, uh, with AI, like as Anish mentioned, like you need a strong platform like, you know, Couchbase to do this uh, decisioning, right? Because AI will only, you know, um, do what you call the classification, but it will not do the decisioning, right? The decisioning still is lies with the application where you will ingest all these data parameters and take the real-time decision, right? So that's where Couchbase comes into picture. And this is just a use case, you know, I'm not going into deep, like, you know, across channels, like this will give you a cross 360 degree customer view and a transaction view across multiple login and transactions. Let's say a bad actor is doing a bad transaction on a net banking, he's simultaneously doing on a card, he's simultaneously doing on a UPI. Then how do you get this 360 customer degree view across, right? I mean, for a suspicious entity. And then this is by channel, right? I mean, for each of the channel, let's say net banking for account takeover protection, 
Yeah, um, you have very uh, various very specific kind of rules, right? For example, multiple change of credentials. You're logging from international location and several bursts of transactions. And you know you're trying to debit from a mule account or a dormant account, and so on and so forth, right? And this is like in UPI, like you, you see very um, the VPI, right? Or the VPI is the UPI handle, right? Containing suspicious keywords, refunds, all of them. And SIM swap, right? I mean, where you try to, you know, uh, swap the SIM and, you know, try to, you know, um, do, um, do account takeover from the, you know, wrong other device and all of this. We're not going into each and every use case, but wallets, it has a very separate um, set of use cases wherein we, we look at the IMEI number or the IP or the wallet ID, right? And various IP addresses as well. And some suspicious names and email IDs, right? I mean, and uh, mobile banking, it's like, you know, as we looked at it, IMPS is another use case, ATM, POS, internal fraud, which is like, you know, the internal users, you know, bad actors within an organization or any other location trying to, you know, fraud the system, right? So that's about it at a very high level, the kind of use cases, you know, that we are looking at, and this is all powered by Couchbase, right? I mean, for the use cases using AI in fraud and risk management. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi, so much. Uh, very nice mm -hmm. insights. You are very crystal clear given the picture. For me personally, Ravi, one interesting point you made was that the analytics is done in one place and the application takes the decision. Yes. That right. was very interesting. It was yeah. so obvious now that yeah. you have said it. Yeah. But you don't yeah. have to replicate Correct. the logic over and over again. Yeah. And, and then the, the fraud models are built because the whole point of modeling is it is the AI data model is it is dynamic, right? It cannot be static. So and that's how it learns from the you know the past data. The more data you have, the better is your model, right? I mean, your model is trained on that data. So I'm imagining that cybersecurity and fraud management are some of the leading edge applications mm -hmm. of AI yeah. in the financial sector. Absolutely. And and we work with some of the largest uh, financial institutes, including the likes of SBI, HDFC, and you know, some of the large customers. Vanish, if I may ask you the same question, do you think cybersecurity and fraud are the leading applications when you talk to BFSI organizations? What As other now priorities for, do we talk about? So the bigger, I mean, the big big time requirements on a, on a business perspective, yes, uh, fraud detection is one of the biggest, and uh, the Latest requirements, I would say, is kind of varying from a good chatbot, uh, a good workflow, especially the field services. Uh, when we talk about uh, not exactly banks but other PFSIs, what we see is um, uh, field service applications. So you go, you have somebody has applied for a loan. They go in there, they scan an Aadhaar card or their document. But rather than sending the photo to the back office and then them verifying it. Uh, the uh, if the if the system is able to extract the data from so if I scan my Aadhaar, my first name, last name, date of birth, my address, can be extracted from the document and form is filled automatically. So workflow automation, process automation uh, okay. is kind of is kind of getting into the picture, but not imbibed completely because you can't have mistakes there. A small uh, typo or a, or a extraction mistake is going to cost a lot because it, ha it has to be verified. Somehow it has to be verified because the trust is not there on AI or it is not refined it. But we are seeing use cases doing that, use cases of uh, doing that. So adding to uh, Ravi's point, like uh, for the fraud detection, you need data. You need a lot, lot of data to train the model uh, to get the right mm -hmm. information out. And that is where we were talking about the lack of uh, uh, cl clear or sophisticated data points. Uh, with that is basically it is available with the large banks. With the large banking enterprise that they obviously have. But a mid-sized bank and a, a comparatively newer bank will struggle to get that amount of data. So they'll have to depend on somebody like Bipmo, uh, who has a whole set of data. So they are they have trained their models in a much more efficient way than a mid-sized bank or a, a new enterprise can even think of, can even uh, do it in the next 10 years. So that is where the experience and the uh, capability of uh, organizations like Bipmo come into picture. They have this large data set, so they're overcoming some of the shortcomings of or uh, challenges that these banks face. And they already, that's the obvious thing. The, their model will be trained with multiple data sets from multiple sources, and they have uh, in, invested so much in that AI engine so that it is trained a lot and the data is refined and the, uh, the 
data which is available is also much more variety than a single bank can attack. Okay, okay. So we work with both banks and uh, you know uh, other uh, organizations who are looking for a fraud solution. It doesn't have to be only banks. Banks are our largest customers, and we also work with you know fintechs, you know the wallet providers, and the PSPs and organizations like the merchants or anyone, right? I mean, looking for fraud solution. As you saw, right, our fraud platform is very versatile and very flexible. It's a low code, no code platform which can integrate with you know the likes of Couchbase or any similar in memory databases. Um, so, so I, I don't know uh, who asked this question and what is their role. I, I'll be happy to you know take it in more detail. And the next question I say, suppose there is a new fraud which comes in that case, how it's going to train your model? Yes. So every fraud, I mean, the slide that you saw, we look at two patterns. One is the past transaction history. And the second is the, you know, the user behavior, right? If there is a chargeback or if there is a refund or if there is a fraudulent claim in the past, that does go into the decisioning of the tra transaction in the real time, right? So yes, it is going to the whatever is a fraud outcome, it gets back into our model to, you know, get the right out decisioning, uh, you know, outcome. So. I'm curious about one thing, uh, Ravi. Yeah. Is Webmo focused in India or which other countries do you support? So we are, a, I mean, um, global company. I mean, our focus is definitely India, Southeast Asia, APAC and Middle East Africa. So we, we are working with almost 180 banks across right in these regions when it comes to fraud the challenges faced by banks in different countries are they similar yes no it's every country is different right india is okay. india and apac and this middle east africa is a two-factor market where you have to do authentication but whereas, whereas like in india with the upi fraud it's a, like very unique to india right i mean whereas outside mm -hmm. of india mm -hmm. the online frauds are very different in certain areas of wallet frauds are very different so, so yeah, I mean, so definitely in India, the card fraud is much less other than the wishing and social engineering kind of a fraud that, that happens. But mm -hmm. I mean, in India, the biggest nightmare that we are seeing is the UPI, UPI frauds. So the previous question was from Abhishek Amar from Canara Bank. Canara Bank is our customer on not on fraud and risk management. We would love to add them. So definitely Avinash, I will connect with you offline. So, and yes, Sunil, like, are you working with cooperative banks? Not yet. We, we would love to work with uh, cooperative banks, uh, Sunil, and uh, so that would be good. Some notable frauds in cooperative banks. So, yeah. I think we need this kind of protection. Yes, yes. it can be protection. deployed on a hosted model wherein for cooperative banks, you don't need your own instance. We can host it for you. And, you know, and then we can build and operate for you, right, on your behalf, actually. So. Mr. Avinash Purohit from Canara Bank has messaged his number. Do you want to capture it? Yes. For cybersecurity okay. logs, how to handle DDoS attack. So DDoS is not part of this fraud and risk management. It is part of your broader IT um, uh, posture. So we would love to hear from you, Nishant. I mean, so on the DDoS, because DDoS is pr primarily at a network and at a DNS level, right? Not And, not, uh, and less at a um, application level. So ideally your network or um, your IT mm -hmm. security, security should handle. But if not, you should have circuit breakers in your application to handle the DOS attack. But um, let's say, I mean, it is outside the realm of the current one. So, so sorry to say. So that's different from fraud, as yeah. I can understand fundamentally. Yeah. Yeah. Fraud is more customer focused, where you yeah. are trying to defraud a customer's account. So, Ravi, is there some overlap between fraud and cybersecurity in terms of some kind of underlying technology or architecture or database? Or are they two separate yes. domains? No, no. So what is cybersecurity, fin crime, fraud? These are all very overlapping uh, domains, right? I mean, or, you know, I mean, you call it uh, risk. So, and AML. So, all of these are like end of the day. Because we have created so many divisions, especially in the banks, like you know, the risk is a separate team, compliance is a separate team, and then the you know application risk is a separate team, right? And different people are looking at it, and a lot of these departments run different different softwares and different applications. But what happens? The bad actors or the fraudsters make advantage of these things exactly because, let's say I'm doing a net banking fraud, right? It'll go to my core banking operations team, right? Whereas I'm doing a you know, AML fraud, it will go to some different department in the compliance, uh -huh. right? Whereas I'm, if I'm doing a, you know, some other 
uh, just wait a minute. So, uh, so if I'm doing like, you know, a uh, risk, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, frauding, I mean, I'm not paying, right? I mean, the credit risk, it's, it goes to a completely different department. So by the time the departments talk to each other, gather the data, the damage is done. So that's why you need a unified view across the channels, what the bad actors are doing, right? I mean, if it's a bad actor in one channel, he will try to break into another channel also. So. Right. So, so question is, to Anish uh, here, is the data management layer, the data setup layer, the database, to what extent that can be common across the multiple applications and does that really benefit? I would like rephrase the question from a database to a data. So can the data be used across uh, multiple verticals, multiple use cases? Yes, obviously. Databases is more on the, uh, I would say that, I would call that more on the administrative side. So do you want the databases to be common or do you want them to be separated is more on the um, administration side. But data can, data is obviously shared. So same data can, so as uh, uh, Ravi was mentioning, the data which is captured on the IMEI ID, uh, that might be from the networking. Uh, the uh, the IP addresses may be from the networking. But that is that is definitely using the fraud to identify. Okay, say one SIM card is on why on IMEI. Suddenly it is going from for two years. Now suddenly the SIM card is on a different IMEI. It is one option is one possibility is that the person has changed the device. Second op second possibility is that it's a possible fraud transaction by a, a SIM duplication or a SIM movement. So so the same network information is being used is going to be used by a fraud detection system to do the uh, to create a pattern out of it. So to identify or to mark a transaction as a different. So data sharing, obviously, database sharing, I would call that as an administrative decision or a DBA level of this, uh, that is going to be. That. So there's a question from Nishan, like, I mean, how to handle DDoS? I think the it was not a right terminology. The question was, how can we check spike for number of requests? What we, This is what we call it is a velocity check. For example, some bad guy is using your credit card uh, five times in the last 10 15 minutes, right? Because he got hold of your credit card, so we will try to do five or ten transactions, right? So that is like a velocity check which we will attribute to the user behavior, right? Have you done such kind of a transaction in the last six months or five months? If the answer is no, then we would definitely block, right? We will see that some bad usually see what is a pattern, right? If some bad person is getting hold of your account number or a card number, they will try to do as many transactions and make maximum damage to you, right? Or maximum benefit for them, correct? So it's a very simple phenomena. So they will try to buy something, they will try to, you know, withdraw money. If, if, if they found your debit card, they will try to do multiple transactions, withdraw money from ATM and similar behavior, right? So that is a velocity check, right? And that is the reason like, you know, we, um, we identify these kind of a behaviors using our velocity check. So I'm not sure if that answers Mr. Nishan, but so I think what, this is what you're looking for actually, not the DDoS. So thank you once again. Have a nice day. See you again sometime on an interesting topic.